This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. My name is John Alderbridge. Um, I'm a painter, sculptor, mixed mediaist. I deal with a lot of materials, attitudes, feelings, conditions, realities and sensibilities. I, uh, ages ago, was born in the South, 1933. So I've been hanging out for a while. And I grew up afraid, uh, af really, of my own voice. And when I was a kid, my father used to cut all of my hair off to save money. I had these little gold rim glasses that were round and very, very gold, and two front teeth in the same voice that I had and that I have now when I was in the second grade. So you know, I was weird. And the cats gave me a nickname. It was Kokimo, right? So Kokimo was a little guy who was afraid to say anything because my voice was too big at the time and because I was interested in everything. My mother used to get angry with me because I'd go around the house tearing up the window shades to paint on. Okay? And I would stay up all night because my father said, you can do what you want to as long as you want to. I like that airplane, son, you're building, but you do your homework and you do anything you want to. I had a father who loved uh, music very much. He loved young Duke Ellerton. He loved Hillbilly. He loved Chopin. He just loved music. And I had a mother who had the greatest bosom in the world, okay? She loved her children, and she loved the idea of music and art, and she wrote poetically all the time. I think the act of creativity and the practice of the arts is a kind of audacity that has a tendency to be anything that its creator allows it to be or sees fit for it to be. So watch artists. You know, they put them in jail early. Anytime there's a transition in progress, they gather up all the artists and lock them up. Because we are the people like you who sit with ourselves long enough to discover who we are. We have no fear of being lonely, just a little bit concerned about what is humanity really? How much responsibility do we give to becoming human? Apparently, we are not that yet. Because if we were, we would not allow racism to become culture. I came to California and to Los Angeles from Chicago. And uh, I, you know, I didn't know anything about Los Angeles. And Watts was the first community that sort of introduced itself to me. It was a Sunday afternoon when my wife and I, being new in Los Angeles, I came in 1963, mm -hmm. October. And this was about November of 63, and I was driving down 103rd Street from Alameda Street, mm -hmm. and I saw this mysterious looking thing reaching up through the trees. I said, what in the world is that? You know what I mean? And I, drew, I drove a few blocks, and it looked to me as if I could get to it if I turned off and headed toward it. Yeah. And so I came down Graham Street, not knowing what street that was, and I got to 107th Street, and I said, there it is, and I turned in. And this little image was the first thing that I saw aside from the towers. There was a little house yes. that looked just like all the rest of the houses. The only difference was it was decorated. 
with yeah. flowers and yeah. uh, I think there were some poetic statements written on the wall yeah. and there was something somewhere that said Watts Towers Art Center and there was something, something written on the side of the house that indicated it was very much about children. Think about the ancestors that touched this community, this site. The ancestor, Simon Rodia, who created the Watts Towers. 1921, when he started, that was not city of Los Angeles at all. That was in the county of Los Angeles. By the time that he finished, or walked away from the site in 1954, it's now city of Los Angeles. At 1765 East 107th Street, he didn't sell anything. He gave it to a friend. His structure, the Watts Towers, his land, he gave it to a friend who never called him insane. And the man who, who he left the work with, Mr. Man, uh, his name was Mr. Saucida, lived right across the street from where the, 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 the art center is today. And Mr. Saucida never realized uh, what a precious gift that was. And six months, months after he received it, I think he sold it for about $1,000, right? And the man who bought it was a Mr. Montoya. And what the city uh, uh, said publicly was, we, we, don't, we don't know what that is. We never issued uh, a permit for anybody to do anything. And uh, Mr. Montoya, before you can do your business, you're going to have to clean up that property. You're going to have to tear down the watch towers. Uh, he said, I, I, I don't know what it is either, but it's beautiful, and I, I won't touch it. But in 1975, the city of Los Angeles was donated the property that uh, was the Watts Towers site. And uh, all of the work that I had done in Compton with Judson and other people, uh, people started to encourage me to take this examination to get involved with the cities reception of this work and I was I was really hesitant to do that because I was thinking in terms at that particular time in 1975 that I wanted as an artist to get back in my studio and work I took the exam and ended up being the person that was selected to, to, to direct the Watts Towers. I couldn't believe it, you know. <laughs> and so fortunate to be here in this community where so much music mm -hmm. is innate. 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 Charlie Mingus exactly. came from here. Exactly. You know, exactly. Eric Dolphy came from here. Yes. Billy Higgins. Yes. Horace Tap Scott. Yes. Johnny Otis. Yes. Little Esther yeah. Phillips. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's beautiful. I kept meeting all of these exciting musicians. This is when I met Billy Higgins. I met Buddy Collette. I met Pancho Sanchez and uh, Tootie Heath and uh, Alonzo Davis, who was then director of Brockman Gallery, and I decided that we would put our small resources together. We didn't have very much at all, and think in terms of introducing a heritage festival that would focus really on the exciting musical history of the region. The festival was visualized by internationally acclaimed artist John Otterbridge, who was the director of the Watts Towers Art Center for 17 years. In Los Angeles, there was this multi-ethnic mix, and a great way to celebrate the multicultural beauty of Los Angeles might be to look at an instrument like the heart, <laughs> the pulse, this, this, this life rhythm and uh, it, it, the, the common ground that we all hold in that symbol. And we related that to the drum. And uh, so people like 2D Heath, Billy Higgins, uh, a young man from Nigeria, Jimmy Solanke, who was in, who was in the city at that time, uh, we thought that it would be just a wonderful thing to do a festival that would look at uh, the drum and its, its role in history. Uh, the tradition of the drum discipline 
and language as it is activated by uh, world people. And I had this idea that I put before the group about a festival of drums that would focus on the fact that we don't know cultures in the world that do not have a drum of some sort. And at that time, Jimmy Solanke from Nigeria said, the heart is a drum. We all have this beating thing in us. And it would be significant if we could bring the cultures together and have everybody bring a drum. Art, in that there are many cultures that don't have the word art in the culture. I always substituted that for being audacity. Art with an audacity to be anything that it needed to be at a given time. It has that kind of uh, wholeness about it. So the practice of life, the practice of art, is tangible to the practice of being. And we're not just talking about uh, the experiences of philosophy and religion and uh, the spectrum of the world as we know the world, but the entire universe, that whole language of creativeness. Hey, Rosie, how are you? <laughs> Good seeing you. Good to see you, too. I came to trade some dirt. Oh, I heard about this. I brought you some dirt. <laughs> oh, okay. Got the whole thing. Got the whole thing. So I guess we'll start. We'll start. I got one. the dirt. I got this one. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go do it. Let's try some dirt. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm glad that you're here. Yeah. You know, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Trading dirt. Yes, and but I don't... brought you dirt. I oh. brought you dirt from your dear friend's house, Kenzie. Oh, <laughs> wow, Kenzie. She's excited. No kidding. She's very excited. Well, Kenzie's got a real hip environment, you know. He does. Uh, all environment. of his work. And, and, and the fact that he's sort of straightened things out, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, you can see what he has, and he has everything he has. there. So I brought uh, the special shovel. Mm -hmm. This one is Charles Dixon's from oh, Spirits beautiful. of the Ancestors. Yeah. And he made it so that we could use it. And uh, incidentally, we have all of the art center directors on here, including yourself. Oh, so we have a, another extension of artists participating in this project and trading dirt. Wow, it's a group. It's a group <laughs> affair. It's a, it's a group really, affair. really. So, uh, do you mind if I take a little of your dirt? No, ma'am. Okay, it's I'll yours. Take, you know, whatever you need to do. This one, I'm going to take back to the center. Here we uh -huh. have Mr. and Mrs. Pichado, we have Mr. Aguirre, and we have Kenzie. Old and friends. We're going, to, we're going to put a little of yours in here. Okay. A little of yours in here. And now you can just, I'll move this out of your way mm -hmm. because this is Kenzie's dirt. That's Kenzie's That's dirt. That's Kenzie's dirt. He wants An you to have it. An old partner. He wants <laughs> you to have it. Thanks, so, Kenzie. We're just going to, uh, I'll let you just uh, okay. put a little uh, dirt over here on the side. All right, right. So that uh, we can. Uh, you know, I'm getting the feeling that this is a real mix-up of dirt here. <laughs> <laughs> you think so? Oh, yeah. Uh, so? Really. I like all that chicken feed in there. Uh-huh. You know? Yeah. Give me some good dirt. And, and you know, the, the mature, the, the what, what do you call it? The um, manure. Manure. Of uh, chicken. Doo-doo. Doo-doo. Chicken, <laughs> chicken mess. <laughs> There's some of that in the dirt. Dirt. A lot of that. So this is, that. this is good stuff right here. <laughs> Good stuff. Mm -hmm. Real fertile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're going to give you some real fertile dirt, too. Kenzie's <laughs> was great. It was just uh, so I'm, full of Yeah, stuff. yeah. Okay. And Kenzie, you got a couple of cats around there? He has a couple of cats around there. Uh-huh. Running all over the place. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's great. Now you, this was an industrial area before, before you... Uh, yeah, so occasionally you're going to run into uh, the actual... Hardness of, the f of industry. Uh huh. Old foundations. Uh, you know, old foundations, uh -huh. old metal parts uh -huh. at times. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then I think this was a production house back in the 30s, uh -huh. uh, the warehouse. Uh -huh. And so a lot of the stuff that was left over you'll find as you move around uh -huh. the space. Yes. yes. Interesting. Okay. I think that's good enough. Okay. I think that's a good enough hole. I mean to trade some dirt here. Let me get a little of Kenzie's special dirt here. <laughs> we got some, um, look, we got some balls in here. Look, 
Kenzie sent you a bow. So <laughs> Kenzie, that's that's gonna grow something. That's gonna grow something. <laughs> yeah. I got earthworms in here. Uh -huh. I got all kind of fertile stuff oh. in here, John. Oh, kind of stuff. Look at that dirt. Oh, wow. Yeah, is that beautiful dirt? So this is the idea. This is the idea. The weaving of the dirt. The weaving of the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> All there right. There you go. Okay. There you go. Okay. All right, okay. now give me some of your dirt over here so I can uh, I see. take it to um, Dominique. I'm going to see Dominique after this. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm going to take her some of your dirt. Okay. <laughs> You'll be over at uh, St. Elmo's. St. Elmo's Village. Roger. What a wonderful place to be. Yeah. So yeah. We're, we're involving uh, many, 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 many artists in this project. Well, I'll tell you what. It all starts with the dirt. From the dirt, from the dirt. <laughs> and I got these, uh, the worm in there. Now, it's interesting that the worm yeah. has five hearts. Yeah. I went to Mr. and Mrs. Pichado, mm. Mr. Aguirre, Kenzie, John, and then Dominique. So I'm making five stops. Oh, so that's good. those five hearts that we got in this worm that I just brought you. Thank you. <laughs> in the dirt. In the worm. In the dirt. You know, your images, they just bring up all kind of memories for oh. me. Oh. <laughs> yes, as, as a glad, child. I'm glad, really. Uh, and me also, yes. as, as you told the story a few minutes ago. My father was a storyteller, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm a storyteller. And sure uh, I begin my stories when I used to do them with kids with once upon a time when the monkey drunk wine and the goat got choked. And at the <laughs> end of my story, I go, I say, I, ran around, I went around the house and stepped on a nail and that was the end of my tale. So <laughs> at this point, yeah. we're gonna go see Dominique yeah. and uh, get some dirt, trade some more dirt. Yeah, but okay. I just wanted to end that story with uh, went around the house and stepped on a nail and that was the end of my tale. Watch out for the nail. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go get some dirt. Let's okay. go get these buckets. <laughs> I'm going to recite for you a poem that my mother gave me very, very young that was heard on the radio every Sunday. And I have to tell you about this because, and recite this to you simply because it was such an important event in my life. And there are many, but this one I'll never forget. She came to me one Sunday and she, she, she said, called me Johnny Boy. She said, Johnny Boy, there's a poem that comes on the radio every Sunday afternoon. You know that program that we listen to? Classical music? It's a yes, ma'am, mama. Always yes, ma'am, mama. She said, that program comes on with a poem. Have you listened at that? I said, yes, ma'am, mama. She said, can you recite it for me? No, ma'am, I <laughs> can't do that. She says, well, what you're going to do, you're going to sit and write that poem down until you have all of it. Yes, ma'am, mama. And I did that for three or four Sundays until I had the poem, and then I had to go through all this sweat and chore of memorizing that poem. So here's what the poem said. The poet with his pen and the peasant with his plow. It makes no difference who you are. It's all the same somehow. The king upon his throne, with the jester at his feet, the sharp girl and the actress, and the woman on the streets. It's a life of smiles, and a life of tears, a life of hope, and a life of fears. A blinding current of rain, and then a brilliant burst of sun. A biting, tearing pain, and then a bubbling, sparkling of fun. So no matter what you have, don't envy those you meet. It's in the game, it's all the same, the bitter and the sweet. So if things, if things don't seem so cheerful, you just show a little fight, and for every bit of darkness, there's a little bit of light. And for every bit of hatred, 
There's a little bit of love. And for every cloudy morning, there's a midnight moon above. I said, all right, mama. In 1952, when I went down to take an examination to get into flight school, I waited for an hour and a half after taking the examination. And some sergeant called my name. And I went to the counter. And he said, who the bridge? Uh, well, how do you say your name? I, I said, out of bridge, sir. Why? Oh, okay, okay. He said, look like you did pretty good on your exam here. I said, thank you, sir. He said, but they got a quota for y'all. Ain't taking none of y'all in flight school right now. That was the most painful experience in my whole life. The, the sky turned purple. I didn't let them see me crying. But I walked away from the counter. In uniform, I went down the street and took another examination and was on my way to military training in the Army. And as angry as I was and as hurt as I was, they taught me how to build bombs. I became an ammunition specialist, right? Chemical, radiological, biological warfare. The man who loved bird nest became an ammunition specialist. And when I was discharged in 1955, two days back into the country on a cold day, December 29th, 1955, I got on a crowded bus in uniform, duffel bag, calluses on my hands, with memories of friends of mine who didn't come back, and they ushered me to the back of a bus. I cried. I didn't let them see me cry. I screamed. I didn't let them hear me scream. But I became an activist. And I discovered that the power of the creative process could be a tool to activate the changes that all of us acknowledge and we know must take place. Thank you. Thank you.